uh, Chuck Norris 13 years before that even, back in 1980 with the, the movie Octagon. So did yourself and Chuck Norris, uh, did that friendship from which you met in 1980, did it sort of last all the way through, dare I say? Absolutely, Jim. Um, I first met Chuck in 1978. Okay. I had uh, I was partners in a string of martial arts schools here in Australia called Zendo Kai, and my partner Bob Jones went to America in '78. Met up with Chuck, asked him if he would come out and maybe do some demonstrations at some some of the first kickboxing matches that we ever held in Australia. So Chuck came out. I was demonstrating on the same card, demonstrating different Okinawan weapons. Chuck and I just became instant friends and he said to me if you ever get to america look me up and we'll do some training which you can imagine for an aussie kid you know was like oh my god what an opportunity i didn't know whether i'd end up in the states but as it turned out i was working as personal bodyguard to linda ronstad which some people would still remember and uh linda wanted me to go and work for her full time in california so off I went. The first person I called was Chuck. I ended up training every morning at Chuck's house. And he was in the early stages of the octagon that you mentioned, one of the first ninja kind of themed movies. And because he knew I could handle all the Okinawan weapons, he wanted me to play one of his, or their main nemesis in the movie, Keo. I wore a him crimson sort of headdress they had my eyes darkened out because technically I was supposed to be Asian, you know, because yeah. Tadashi Yam Yamashita or Yamashita was the, like my boss. Kyo was his henchman. So that, that was the start of my movie career. And that's 1979. And, uh, you know, that just started an incredible journey and, and I'm sure we'll go through different things, but the great thing is uh, Judy, my wife and I actually just went to Hawaii um, in January, spent a couple of weeks with Chuck and his wife in Hawaii. So to think that the friendships last that long is just gold for me, you know. And he was, for those who don't know, he was even best man at my wedding to Judy in 1993. I always laugh. I said, well, we got Chuck just in case anyone started any shit at the wedding. You know, we'd have somebody to deal with it. But he's he's been an absolute dear friend and still is and was was instrumental in starting my whole career in movies, you know, which, as you mentioned, is over eighty movies now. So it's been a it's been a wonderful friendship, and it's uh, it's something I very much uh, cherish. Yeah, and even you mentioned there, obviously having that friendship and that lifelong friendship uh, with Chuck as well. The, before Walker Texas Ranger came out in 1993, had he discussed this project maybe once or twice that he was working on? Had he mentioned it to you in the past about Walker Texas Ranger, <coughs> Walker Texas Ranger, <laughs> and um, uh, in in terms of maybe having thoughts about your thoughts on it, and would you be up for doing some work in it? In, in terms of the, had he mentioned that idea to you, or when did? Walker, Texas Ranger first come to light for you in terms of Chuck? No, because I, you know, was always with Chuck and we trained together all the time. I was well aware of the intended idea for series. I've got to tell you, though, that he was even a little nervous about it, you know, about going from film or movies, you know, to the small screen, as we call it. Because back, it's changed now, but back then... If you were a, a, a movie star, you know, it was if you went to television, it was almost considered that your career as a leading man on the on the big screen was coming to an end. Do you know what I mean? It became a secondary thing. Obviously, before we get into that, it's changed now. You've got mega stars like Al Pacino going straight to streaming stuff on TV. But again, back then it was considered a little risky. So Chuck was a little apprehensive, but he decided to give it a go. And of course, the rest is history. There's not many people get a series of go for nine seasons. And he kept doing his movies as well, you know. So it turned out to be the right decision to make. He asked me if I'd be involved to the extent that the first ones, a uh, few I, I was working, not just stunt coordinator, but more as fight coordinator. But 
I had sort of started a, a career myself, you know, in, you know, and again, in lower budget action films. And I just felt it's not something I wanted to do at that stage. I like the idea of acting. But again, I, I did a number of episodes. And as you know, when, as you mentioned, I ended up coming on quite a few guest stars and, and that was fantastic. But again, I was off in the Philippines and Thailand and different places, you know, sort of doing my own leads again in these smaller action movies. So from what I'm gathering there, the Chuck maybe asked you to be a leading role, maybe one of the, the main sort of characters in Walker, no, Texas Ranger? No, not, not a main character. No, no. It would have been nice, but no. It, it was more be involved, meaning, you know, because we, we'd worked on a number of projects together, so... I think he was as much interested in having me uh, act in it, play some guest roles, but uh -huh. but the leading roles were already established, as you mentioned, Clarence Gilliard, who is just absolutely wonderful, and Chuck and all of that, and um, Cherie Wilson, they were the established leads. And again, I'd been away doing my own thing, so it's not like my only direction or career direction was doing whatever Chuck was doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I suppose, uh, Richard, in terms of you mentioned that and the following that Chuck had and obviously being set in Dallas and all the family were heavily involved in this production. It wasn't just Chuck, it was the brothers as well. And uh, do you get the sense you mentioned about Chuck was a bit nervous, but did it help having all the family around him to ha have the brothers directly involved in the project as well? Did that sort of was there a bit of reassur reassurance that it was in their own, it was in the Norris's hands, dare I say, to make it a success. Chuck wasn't really depending on anyone else. I I I would imagine um it, it you know it's always good to have family that you trust. As you know, his brother Aaron became producer yeah. on the show. Though I don't believe Aaron initially started off as a producer, and the same with Eric Norris. Uh, uh Eric was his younger son and Eric became stunt coordinator and has gone on to have an amazing career as a coordinator, you know, post Walker series. But that also, Eric learned basically on the job. There was another gentleman doing the stunt coordinating originally. Eric learned the skills of the trade and then became that. So it's something that gradually happened as the series developed. Um, but again, you know, uh, Mikey's other son, of course, was involved a lot in the show in different roles. So the family were always involved. You know, Chuck was very much about family, you know, regardless. But I think I think Chuck was already very, very established. I don't think the nerves were about could he do the show? It's really was it the right career move to do at the time and and again like i said it's history that it turned out with such an amazing success you know but yeah i mean it, it for me to even go on the show whenever i did it was always like going home do you know what i mean yeah. you're around people you knew you trusted they knew you and what you could do so it was a very comfortable experience that's for sure and obviously, Richard, you appeared in eight episodes. You appeared as some principal characters as well. Did you feel every time that you played a role in uh, Walker, Texas Ranger, whether it be good or bad, that you might have had to sort of alter uh, your appearance, maybe alter how you spoke, maybe sort of make subtle sort of changes that would be different sort of each time as coming back as a recurring sort of character but in different roles each time do you found that exciting but also do you want to feel yeah i don't want the the viewer audience to sort of recognize uh me from a previous character or associate me with a previous character i want this new character to stand on its own two feet oh no i didn't really consider that jim that much you know i mean of course they would make you little look a little different, you know, but it's the way you do it. It was more about the character and how the character behaved, who he was, what sort of a bad guy he was. You know, there was not a lot of concern. There's there's a lot of character actors that ended up every time you see them, you of course they're immediately recognizable, but it just becomes very acceptable to an audience, you know, that this actor is now playing this, that, or whatever character. I, I didn't have the ability to change my voice, you know. I was 
probably sounded a little more Australian back then than I even do now. And I always, even with my own career, I had to learn to neutralize my accent a bit. It's not as important now, but back then they were a little concerned that you sounded anything but American. Um, and you took, uh, took on what they call, you know, a mid-American sort of dialogue. You didn't sound Southern. You didn't sound like you're from, you know, the East Coast of New York. But again, I, I wasn't that good an actor that I could have done that well anyway. <laughs> so I I would just play me and just take on the character. And and you gotta you gotta realize when you look at a show, it's very, you know, a show like Walker, like so many, are very formula driven. You know at the very beginning you've got the good guys being Chuck and Clarence, and you got the bad guy, and you know it's gonna lead to a fight and the bad guys are gonna get beaten up. I mean that's you know it's not like you would expect gone with the wind when you watch an episode of walker you'd go along for an action story knowing the fight's going to happen and that's really i believe what a lot of the audience tuned in for and you know the interesting thing chuck i know always wanted to be when he even started even in his movies he wanted to be the john wayne of martial art movies which is what he achieved, meaning that he never wanted to do a character that was anything but doing the right thing, ethically, you know what I mean, morals yeah. and everything else. And and Walker is a great example of that. I think he was absolutely the John Wayne of martial art action series when he took on the Walker role. And and I still remember there's one episode where he's in a scene with a kid and the kid says you know, Mr. Walker, why did you do that? You know, whatever the thing was. And 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 Walker's answer was, because it's the right thing to do, son. You know, and he yeah. so he always pushed to have a, a very moral message, you know, which, which I thought was fantastic. As far as us, we were very much stereotypical bad guys. And again, you knew you were going to get beaten up at the end of the movie, and that was the way it went. <laughs> I suppose, Richard, as well, coming back each time to the set and maybe working for a week or two weeks or how long the episode was sort of shooting, you obviously, be, because you came back so long and you were there for the first episode as being a stunt director or coordinator as well, you probably got to form really good relationships with not only Chuck, but with Clarence Giller Jr., with um, with uh, Nia Peeples, with uh, Noble Willingham, uh, with Clarence Giller, uh, with Sherry Will Wilson and uh, with Johnson Mills as well. So do, did you sort of value the friendships that you got to make with these sort of people as well? And I assume you got to know them very, very well as well, because sometimes guest actors come maybe for one or two episodes and they may not have one or two dialogues and one uh, interactions uh, with the sort of main cast and then they go about their way. But when you're coming back eight times onto the set or something and you're stunt director, I imagine you get to know the, the, the rest of the cast aside from Chuck Norris fairly well, well, both, both cast and crew, Jim, okay. which was good. Do you know what I mean? Because, again, they know you. They know what you're capable of, and you know them. And it, that's why I, I say it was a real sense of family to go onto the show, you know, which which is always appreciated. You know, even fight-wise, you know, there's a reason that certain actors like to use certain stunt people because they learn to trust them. You know, there's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of trust that goes into doing a fight scene. Is the actor or the stunt person going to get a little nervous and accidentally hit the lead or whatever, you know, that that's got to be factored into whoever somebody like Chuck Norris would use in a fight. And again, because we would trained for years every morning i knew his speed his timing and that likewise with me so all of that led to a very comfortable situation on the set and the crew you know as i said you get to know all the crew so it again it's like old old coming home week when you know when you do eventually go back no matter how much uh, later it is you know in the show I suppose, Richard, when you're doing 12, 13 episodes a season, maybe a bit more, in fact, in terms of Walker, Texas Ranger, in the early seasons when you could be talking around 20 episodes, and you're doing that over nine seasons, obviously, and you're doing week in, week out, your, uh, your scripting and your filming, um, fight scenes and choreography scenes, and obviously we all know the fight scenes that 
they can be scripted and they can be videoed and you're shooting from different angles. So a fight scene that might appear on our TV screens uh, that last maybe six, seven minutes could have been taken an hour, two hours or even three or four hours to shoot from different sort of angles and camera takes and uh, different sort of viewpoints until they're happy with the actual scene and sort of self. So when you're doing that over nine seasons and dare I say maybe... We have 365 days a year. You're doing that over nine months a year. Did you notice this when you came back, maybe on the later seasons of Walk or Texas Rangers, maybe eight or nine, did you feel that maybe I had a bit of wear and tear on Chuck having to do that day in, day out over nine seasons in terms of the multiple fight scenes that he had to do for Walk or Texas Ranger? Because I imagine sometimes it, it does take its toll. I think, yes. You know, there's a couple of things to look at with that. First of all, when you start, you know, it, it, whether it's a movie or a series, and the same would have been to Chuck, you're still feeling out what the hell is this show and what is my character. You know, there's always nerves associated with introducing a new character. The The upside of six, seven, eight seasons is it's it's almost like on autopilot. You know what I mean? Like, all the DPs, the camera people, they know exactly where to put the camera. A director will come in and almost be like a glorified traffic cop because, you know, Chuck and all the regulars know exactly what the character's going to do, how they're going to react to a different situation. And as I said, all the crew, they're just like a well-oiled machine. So in that sense, there's not a lot of stress. I mean, the stress comes from coming up with new shows, you know, how do you keep coming up with a different adventure for your, your leads? And I guess, uh, but then they have wonderful writers. Chuck was always very involved. Aaron was very involved in that aspect. So I know, I don't think it was stressful at all in that sense. Otherwise I wouldn't have done nine seasons. You know, I, again, the beauty is going back in season eight and, and especially the last one, like you mentioned, we did, it's a bit sad knowing it was the final episode, you know, but yeah. again, I always marvel that it just, it's like a freight train, you know, but everybody knows their job. And if they didn't by that stage of the game, they were in the wrong place, you know. <laughs> and Richard, bringing on to the current day, what's everything like in the life of Richard Norton at the moment in 2023? Uh, obviously, you've been in the business since uh, 78, a long, long time Uh Coming up nearly on 50, 50 years, I say, in the business now, uh, Richard. And uh, what's the present outlook looking for Richard Norton back in Australia at the moment? Are you more involved in the local Australian scene and maybe some projects based in Australia and the indie scene based around there? Yeah, no, I'm still very much involved. I, I must uh, say quite gleefully that I'm just getting a great balance in life at the moment not stressing about working or not working, you know, uh, and as a result, some some good things are still happening. I'm actually off to, you might have heard of Cynthia Rothrock. Cynthia's an old friend. We did, I think, eight movies together, martial artist, and we first met in the Hong Kong movie scene. Well, she's uh, done a fundraiser for a film called Black Creek, so I'm off to Arizona next week to play a a despicable bad guy in that. Um, I'm doing probably lately not just acting, but also doing a lot more fight coordinating. Uh, you know, I did the last two Suicide Squad movies as fight coordinator. Did the uh, Fury Road, which I had a role in, but was also that's the Mad Max franchise yeah. with Dr. George Miller. Did that one, and we just completed uh, the latest Mad Max, which is coming out in April next year. That's exciting. Um, and I've been cast in a couple of roles. I'm even cast as a lead in an animated Western, which I'm excited about. Uh, hey. Not only because it's something I've never done before, but because they're going to make me look 30 years old. So how good is that, Jim? And I don't even have to get any Botox or anything. I'll be able to just <laughs> look good. But I'm excited about that. And, yeah, there's a number of roles. So everything's rolling along, but I'm just as happy teaching i still love my martial arts i'm still teaching seminars still teaching a lot of uh, uh classes around the country um so just enjoying life as i said a nice balance i'm no longer stressing oh i gotta get to work gotta get to work i'm 
I'm just as happy to not work, as I said, as as work. And it's exciting, you know, and it's been, I've had an incredible career. Again, thanks for Chuck giving me that opportunity. Because I, when I went to America, I had no aspirations to be in movies. I was, since 73, I'd been working as a personal bodyguard. Started off with the Rolling Stones and, you know, worked with Fleetwood Mac, David Bowie for eight years, James Taylor. And anyway, on and on it goes. I was in that for over 20 years. And I probably stopped that in the early 90s and thought, well, it's time to give that up. Let's continue on with the movie. So I'm 74 in January, you know, so time has passed. It, but to still be actively involved in the industry after all these years, again, feel very, very blessed. So life is good. Life is good. And do you still, uh, dare I say, flying from Australia or those long haul flights into the US, uh, USA, you're still making those quite regularly, dare I say. So, Richard, uh, in terms of that. So uh, you've, I'd say you frequent air miles build up at this stage. Yeah, I, and I still hate it. It's still such a slog. You know, it's like 15 hours straight to fly from LA into Melbourne, give or take, depending on which direction you're going. But I've also, ex I just know that's what it takes. There's nothing I can do about that. So unless they can teleport me and it's still fine because I'm still a resident, you know, of the US. So um, still enjoy, you know, opportunities over there. But I must say, um, being back in Melbourne, Australia, there's nothing beats it. I'm, I, I love, I love Australia and I love being, you know, back where I am, but uh Listen, I, you know, as I said, Arizona, that's a long trip, but you take off, you do what you got to do and, and get on with life because, God forbid, I would complain about the opportunities I've had. As I said, incredibly thankful. So a long haul flight is the least I can uh, sort of give up in order to keep living the dream. <laughs> and Richard, you've done movies all across the world and uh, you've played with many characters. I suppose to put an Irish element, an Irish sort of twist to it, have you ever sort of filmed anything in Ireland or was the most prominent uh, Irish actor that you probably have worked with or shared a set with? Now, the closest would be, uh, I think, for me, a Sean Connery. But okay. is he Irish or Scottish? Was he? He's Scottish. He's Scottish. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So I shouldn't, I'll probably get in the trouble there. But no, I, I would love, I have, I've got friends that are living in Ireland that I work with, believe it or not, in Lithuania on a series, The New Adventures of Robin Hood. I was okay. stunt coordinator and all that. And they're living uh, in Dublin, I believe. I would love to go there. And I, I've been in most places in the world, but not actually Ireland. So that would That's still... surprising for an Australian. Normally, it's one of the first protocols for an Australian to come to Irish. Yeah. The Irish are so frequently coming to Australia. There's a sort of a, there's, there's a kind of know. connection between both people. So to get your filmmaking word out there, Jim, to, if they're doing a movie in Ireland, I want to be in it. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's we'll see. I, I, in terms of martial arts movies there in Ireland, I suppose uh, we'll uh, we'll have to sort of see what we can do. It might have to be more of Viking sort of uh, movie or an epic sort of thing. Love that. I love that. Viking movies, great. You know, I love the idea of that. All those movies are so fantastic. Action is action, by the way. You know, whether it's martial arts or not. Um, action is action. So happy to step into whatever role you come up with, Jim. I'll be waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> yes, true. I, I'll get the word out there. And uh, Richard Norton, so for the final 30 seconds, if I can turn it over to you, uh, if you could sum up your experience on Walker, Texas Ranger, uh, obviously throughout the seasons, you were in the very first episode, you were in the very last episode as well. If you just sum it up in two sentences. What would Richard Norton like those two sentences to read to, uh, in terms of summarizing his time on Walker, Texas Ranger? I would just say that Walker has been such an important and, and fondly remembered part of my journey in film. You know, to, yeah. to have that on the resume and the experience of it. And as you know, Clarence passed away some time ago. You know, I still have memories, by the way, and we're getting into another conversation now. But even, it, you know, when you talk about family, I remember when I did, I played the escaped convict. I was the lead sort of villain and I had all these bad guys under my wing. I remember being on the set and 
and I, I, I rehearsed a scene because I had some big dudes that are my men, you know, and I remember Clarence saying to me, Rich, he said, let me give you a bit of advice in this role. He said, you don't have to do anything. He said, look how animated and how large these characters are. He said, you're the boss. The less you do, the more power you'll have. And boy, I took that advice and I still use that advice to this very day when playing a bad guy. And there's little things like that that Clarence would bother to share with me some of his experience as an actor, you know, that helped me in my career, you know, in later years. So I could go on and on about some of the experiences. And again, uh, one of the thrills for me, by the way, uh, mentioning I'm doing this martial arts Western with Cynthia was the final episode of Walker. To be on horseback with long hair and everything else, a nice big moustache, six guns on the hip. You know, I grew up in Australia. We grew up watching. There was the original Texas Rangers series when I was a kid, you know. And so we grew up watching West. And so to be a part of a final ep of Walker where I'm playing a cowboy and a bit of a gunslinger, I mean, how good is that? You know, it was a way to cap 